Hello, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre from Draft to Digital with a Draft to Digital Spotlight. And today I have the collaborative man himself, Zach Bohannon. Zach, welcome to the D2D studio. Hey, Mark. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. So there's so many things that I want to talk to you about. Uh, first of all, let's let's get the background. Could, I, and I wore this specifically for you today. You are a horror no. guy. <laughs> I should have maybe wore a zombie one. But uh, let's talk a little bit about what kind of stuff you write. Yeah, so I primarily write uh, post-apocalyptic uh, fiction, and uh, I started out like you brought up the horror thing. I started out really envisioning being a horror writer, and uh, you know when you get into they started thinking about marketing and stuff like that, uh, you realize that it's it's difficult to write series being a horror author. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and uh, but the the first book I'd really published was a it was a. <clears throat> well, a zombie book, which I was looking at as horror and, uh, and I love post-apoc and that book took off and I was like, Oh, okay, well, uh, and I, I love post-apocalyptic stuff anyway. So that just kind of became the thing I really wanted to write more than anything. So, okay, cool. So, so let, let's explain this. Cause you had this discovery that horror and post-apoc are not the same things. You thought maybe it was just a horror novel, but there is, it's like a sub genre of. Yeah. Like I think that zombie stuff, I mean, obviously gets wrapped up in horror, um, right. where, you know, for obvious reasons. And, um, but, uh, yeah, post-apocalyptic is just weird in general because it is a genre, but it's also can just be a setting. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of a, it's, but it is a genre with, conventions and expectations and tropes and and all that kind of stuff too so it's kind of a it's kind of a weird thing because like i said you can have a book be in a post like a post-apocalyptic setting but have be like a romance or something too so it's kind of a it's kind of a weird thing but there's <laughs> no, definitely I, a lot of horror elements generally so. oh for sure yeah it's usually it's usually a little bit scary <laughs> I, I would say so. World. <laughs> yeah, if only we were living in something like that now, right? <laughs> yeah, well, and I wanted to ask you about that because, I mean, being a, a writer of that, uh, that is, uh, are you getting approached by people who say, hey, you write post-apocalyptic fiction, you know, like The Stand, Stephen King, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, how does it feel uh, now that the rest of the world is is now living in that in that environment that you probably spend a lot more time thinking about than the average bear? Uh, it, I'll be honest with you. It's a little surreal um, just because, you know, and, and uh, it's very cathartic to write this stuff. And, uh, and I obviously love it. Um, but it's like yesterday, it, it really hit me. I was at the grocery store yesterday and like seeing all these people walk around mask and stuff. It's just, it feels really surreal, I think is the best word. And, but it's like, wow, this is actually happening, <laughs> right, right. you know, and um, it, you know, not to the degree that, it happens in the books I write necessarily, but it's, it, it's been very strange. And I will say it's been, it, it's been a little weird writing this stuff lately and working on the books I've been writing, um, working, working on the book I've been working on with this stuff all going on. Right. Um, but, uh, but I'm, um, you know, it, it's, it's a genre I love and stuff and, uh, and, you know, we'll get through everything that's going on obviously. And, and everything will get back to what the new normal will be, but it's definitely been a little strange. That's for sure. Okay. That is uh, interesting. Now, I, I couldn't help notice you were taking a sip of something there. And me being a, a craft beer nerd, I can't not notice that. What What is it that you're uh, happening to enjoy there? It is Samuel Smith Organic Chocolate Stout. Oh, oh. that sounds like just a perfect thing for a lunch. See, I went with coffee. The same color. <laughs> this kind of is like having <laughs> coffee pretty much. It's like, you know, nice thick beer. I, I don't trust a beer I can see through. I'm definitely a stout <laughs> drinker. So, um, and I was like, oh, I'm be talking to Mark. So why not be drinking? It's noon. So it's, why not? That's why I wore the horror t-shirt. Exactly. For, for you. So we, it was, it was kind of like a, 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 a O. Henry story or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> now, as, speaking Speaking of uh, speaking of collaborating, which the characters in the story we're talking about are thinking about the other person. Now, uh, you and um, Jay Thorne uh, collaborate, not only collaborate as writers, I want to hear a little bit about that, but you also collaborate with other writers, Lindsay Broker, Joanna Penn, as well as, um, I mean, that was the original Authors on a Train and so many other things. Could, could you share a little bit about uh, initially your collaboration with Jay and how that came about? Yeah. Um, so J Jay used to do a, I guess I'll tell the short version of the long story. Um, <laughs> he, he used to do a podcast called the horror writers podcast. And, um, when I first got into, uh, wanting to seriously write fiction and actually try to publish something, I, I love podcast and that's kind of the, I, I learned by listening. So I was like, well, 
I want to write horror and I want to be a writer. <laughs> so like I'm, I went into iTunes or whatever and typed in horror writer and horror writers podcast came up and I started listening and learning from him and stuff. This would have been like, I don't 2013, something like that, 2014, right. somewhere in there. And, um, and listen and became a fan of that show. I bought some of his books, became a fan of his books. And, uh, we started emailing each other and, uh, and realized pretty quickly that we had a lot of stuff in common, just as far as like the music we like, and we both have histories and bands and we read a lot of the same stuff. And we just kind of became friends. And, um, you know, I, it, it eventually after, uh, I, I ended up, he, the horror hours podcast ended up going away and then we ended up bringing it back together as a slightly different thing. Um, and I don't know, probably, uh, May, I guess it was less than a year after that was when we finally, and we talked about like the possibility of writing stuff together. Cause Jay's done all kinds of collaborations. Right. Um, but it just took time and we didn't rush it. And uh, eventually led to us co-writing, which has blossomed to this, you know, we have a very unique partnership that a lot of most, most authors who want to co-write are not going to be doing all the things that he and I are doing together with podcast and running live events and all these different things we do on top of writing fiction and now nonfiction together with three story method. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's been a crazy ride. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we definitely, uh, have done a lot of stuff together. <laughs> <laughs> so how does the writing process itself work when you collaborate with Jay, for example, like what's the, what does that look like? How does it, how do you, cause you live in different cities. Yeah. You're not physically together most of the time. Yeah. So it, uh, from book to book, it changes to be honest with you. Um, we, we iterate our process a lot and not any one book has really looked the same. I mean, we have some <clears throat> pretty standard things. Um, you know, you mentioned that we live apart and so we do a lot of communicating through Slack. We do a lot of communicating through zoom. Um, we are very, very big proponents on meeting when you can. Um, so, uh, we try to meet about once a quarter typically. And um, as you mentioned, I, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. He lives in Cleveland, Ohio. Sometimes I go there. Sometimes he comes here. General, or we have our events we'll meet at and make time. But uh, other times we meet in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is about halfway for the two of us. And we'll get like an Airbnb for a few days and just like have a list of stuff we have to talk about. And uh, it can be story ideas. It can be stuff for our nonfiction business, for career author, all that stuff. Um, but on the fiction side, talking about co-writing together, anytime we're starting a new series, we definitely meet in person um, and and hammer out stuff. We get sticky notes all over the wall. Um, <laughs> the things that stay pretty constant in our process is that um, he loves revising and I love first drafting. So mm -hmm. um, typically, you know, we'll come together on story ideas and usually he'll do the outline and then I'll come back through and like give my two cents. I'll add stuff in. I'll leave comments and stuff. There have been books where I've done the outline. It just, like I said, it depends. Uh, I'll go first draft the book. When we first started, I would do the whole book and then send it to him. What we realized was that we could save a lot of work if every couple of days he came right behind me and was editing. Basically, we were in the book at the same time. So typically what will happen now is I'll get I don't know, handful of chapters done, like four chapters or so. And then every couple of days he'll come behind me and he'll read and catch up to me. And so he is going ahead and doing his first round of revisions. And what it allows us to do is he can, let's say that um, there's a character that he's not really feeling and he thinks, you know, need, needs to have like a different motivation. And right. uh, he changes something in the book. He can say, hey, I changed this. Keep this in mind as you're reading this character from here on out. And you know, so later on this will happen or whatever. So, um, we can make changes on the fly so I can start thinking, okay, like this character needs to act like this instead of him having to do it in the whole book on a revision. Um, <clears throat> so we really found that works. We use Google drive for that. Um, when I'm working on books with him, that's, I use Google drive to do all my first drafting. Um, so that way he can easily come behind me and do revisions. Um, and then he, he handles pretty much the whole editing process. Um, once I'm done first drafting, I start thinking about uh, marketing. So covers, uh, the title of the book, how we're going to promote it, 
launch plan, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and there are, there have been instances, we don't do this as much anymore, but there've been instances where once I pass, a, once I'm done with the first draft, I've never read that book again, which I tell <laughs> authors that and they think I'm crazy, but that's the type of relationship and trust that he and I have. Like, I know that he's going to make the book as good as possible and I can just go ahead and start moving on to something else. Cause when I'm done with the first draft, I want the book to be done. Wow. Um, I'm working on my own project now where I'm doing revisions and I'm just like, Oh my God, I'm just ready for this to be over. <laughs> I just want to get this <laughs> to my editor so bad, but uh, yeah, that's kind of the gist of it and the things that have really stuck with us through our process. Well, that's fantastic. And you guys have not only done that successfully together for a while, but you've also bring other authors into that entire experience. And, and I, and I briefly mentioned authors on a train. How did that very first authors on a train where, where you uh, collaborated with two other authors to create a book. How did that turn into this phenomenally unique experience where, you know, you, you can bring a small group together and, 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 and make magic happen? Well, Jay Thorne has the attitude that um, he'll basically ask anybody anything. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think that he's probably reached out to Stephen King and asked him to collaborate on a book before. And I, I don't think I'm joking. Like he, he gets these ideas and he's like, well, what's the worst thing someone can do? They can either say no, or they can just not respond at all. Right. And so he had made a comment. Jay is Jay hates flying and uh, he prefers train travel over anything. So, I mean, he used to travel at his old job when he was a teacher, he'd have to go out to the West coast and um, he would take the train. For, it's like 52 hours from Chicago. He'd have to go to Chicago from Cleveland, which he usually takes a Greyhound. <laughs> um, and then we'll take the train. It's like a 52 hour train trip. And uh, <clears throat> I think he'd made a comment about how he'd done the train and he wrote like almost a whole novel and put some on Twitter or something like that. And Lindsay Broker replied and said, Oh, that sounds cool. I want to go write a book on a train. So of course, <laughs> Jay uh, says, let's do it. And DMs her and he's like, no, I'm serious. Let's do this. And, uh, and I think she was kind of like, okay. And he's like, well, and, and so who else can we ask? And Jay has a really good relationship with Joanna Penn and, uh, and went to her and was like, Hey, is this something you'd be interested in doing? And somehow I ended up in this. <laughs> um, and it just became a thing. Like it all started off a tweet and, uh, we ended up, <clears throat> um, going meeting. We all met in Chicago and uh, we took the train to New Orleans, spent a week together down in New Orleans, walk around the city together, um, you know, you know, really getting to know each other, uh, you know, doing things together, doing things out on our own. And in the meantime, we also planned and wrote a novella, a 40,000 word book. Um, and each of us wrote from a different POV character, the whole story took place on the train from Chicago, New Orleans. And we, <laughs> it was a blast because we were able to use all this stuff from the train. Like uh, our, for instance, like we had this awesome train attendant uh, who, who helped us out on the whole trip. And it's like a 17 hour overnight train trip. And uh, we ended up giving him this really epic death on top of the train, like fighting demons and stuff. And <laughs> Later, Jay and I got actually saw him on another train trip down there and got to tell him and he just flipped out. Um, <laughs> and um, but we wrote this book and it was a, it was a challenge. I mean, I'll tell you, like, because we wanted to have that first draft finished by the end of the week. And you got people on different time zones, right on different times of the day, you know, we're uh, all writing different characters and having to coordinate like, OK, well, my person during this chapter is on this part of the train and you can't put my it was it was crazy. And uh and we definitely had some bumps along the way that we had to go through, but it was, we all worked together and we were all pros and uh, it was, it was definitely an experience I will never forget. <laughs> I love that. I loved hearing about it uh, when you guys first did it. And then you opened it up and it became um, regular experiences. Like you guys have met in Cleveland, you've met in um, uh, not Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah. yeah We've done guess, Pittsburgh. Yeah. Just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, New Orleans. Could you talk a little bit about um, of those in-person intimate experiences that you do with uh, small groups of authors? Yeah. So we do two different types of events. So we do authors on a train, which we've just mentioned, and we've done that trip, um, I think three times now. So we've done it uh, three times with a group, like not just counting with Joanna and Lindsay. So we did it, uh, we've done it twice to New Orleans um, and we've done it one time. We did it this year. Um, we went to, we went from Los Angeles to San Francisco 
and we this year was actually really fun because we rented a a mansion on Airbnb and everyone stayed in the same house and it was it was a blast or 15 of us staying in this huge like old haunted mansion and uh it was so much fun like I'm, I'm so glad we did it that way this time uh but uh so we have those we have the train events and then we also have just these world building weekends that we call them where the authors on authors on a train is more collaborative. So everyone has like, we obviously have the train trip, but then everyone yeah. has a partner that they team up with. And we actually teach collaboration. Um, the, the world building events, which you've been to one of those, Mark, you did the one in Cleveland, you did rock a puck. They are collaborative, but not necessarily on a storytelling level. So everyone's writing their own stories. The collaborative part is we all get in a room together and we do world building and we build out this fictional world. And then everyone writes a story in that world we built and we publish an anthology from that. And those are a ton of fun. We've done a rock a which you came to in Cleveland. We've done sci-fi Seattle. We've done night of the writing dead, which is the Pittsburgh one you mentioned um, yeah. this year, fingers crossed um, that everything's normal. But then we have vampires in new Orleans yeah. um, that we're doing over Halloween weekend. And then we have some other ones planned for next year so. Oh, that is cool. I was going to pop up the, uh, I was just going to pop up that one that, cause it actually has vampires in New Orleans with a little graphic, yep. um, got pictures of some authors on a train. And then you've got, uh, I think that was, uh, the picture in the top right was taken in Cleveland. Yeah. Yep, you're there in the back next to yeah, Jay. <laughs> tall guy, Jim, Jim Cooper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and so this was, uh, this was the, I happen to have it handy. This nice. was the, um, the rock apocalypse, uh, anthology that was uh, produced. It's, it's not, it's not small. It's very, no. very thick. Uh, and it's, so it's published, um, with, with all the authors that were there. And it was a really amazing experience to just have everyone sitting around the table and throwing out ideas. But I wanted to talk a little bit about this, this brand, this, this molten universe media brand that you've created because you're using that as well to um, to collaborate with even more authors. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Molten Universe Media is kind of what Jay and I publish our fiction under. So um, all our fiction is there. Um, as you just showed, we publish our anthologies um, for these events. And I think it's important to mention too, one thing is um, the th every time we do one of these, we pick a local charity as well that yes. all, all the proceeds from the anthology um, none of the writers are making money off of it. It's more of just the experience and it's more of like a keepsake for all the authors, but yeah. we find a local charity in that area and we give all the proceeds to charities. So, um, <clears throat> so we publish those under there. And also we have, um, it is a publishing company where uh, we don't take submissions, but we've reached out to, we personally reach out mostly authors. We meet on these retreats, honestly. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and we've started publishing work. So, um, we, we honestly, we've slowed down on that a little bit. Um, right. we're, uh, we've kind of pivoted, like we do have some stuff we still are going to be publishing through that, but for the most part, multi universe media is, um, just really for Jay and I now, other than a few projects we have in the pipeline, but, uh, right. but it does, we're most likely not going to be doing too much publishing of other authors now. So. Right. And well, and that's the, it's, it's sort of, it's interesting how uh, things change and evolve, right? Authors on a train was a one-time thing. It became something else. It was from this place to that place. It moved to a different city. Um, it, it, I don't think it's nothing if not uh, collaborative and uh, flexible, flexibly changing over time. Absolutely. How important is that then? Uh, the ability for writers to be flexible and to adapt to uh, environments like that? Oh, really important. You know I mean? Like, I mean, you talk about our events, like we obviously want to provide different experiences, um, you know, and, and, and me and Jay don't want to go to the same place all the time. Like I, I don't <laughs> want to do Chicago, New Orleans every time we do authors on training. I mean, especially because I used to live like two and a half hours from New Orleans and I used to go down there all the time. So it's like, I want to go see other places, especially <laughs> tax write off, you know? Right. Yeah. So like I'd never been to San Francisco. So it was really cool to go, to go do that. Um, and yeah, I think you totally have to be able to adapt. I mean, again, like, heck, look what we're doing. We're all having to adapt right now. <laughs> you know, and a lot of like, even when you're talking about environment, like, you know, there's people who aren't necessarily used to working at home all the time and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's really, really crucial. And um, it's another reason why we, for the, the world building weekends, we only do those once. So like, there's only going to be one rock epoch. There's only one night of the writing dead. There's only one right. vampire. Like we're not going to repeat those events because 
we want to make each one of them special, but we also, we don't want to be too comfortable and we don't want other people feeling too comfortable. We want to go provide different experiences and do different things. So sounds like you value uh, ongoing learning, ongoing challenges and, and always raising the bar. Yeah. I think you have to, like, I think you, um, I think you have to continue wanting to learn and continue to better yourself. And I think that, uh, complacency is scary. Like if you, if you feel like, okay, I'm good, I've learned everything I need to know, or I, I don't need to get any better. I mean, we're, none of us are ever going to be master writers. We have to keep learning and evolving and, um, you know, honing our craft and uh, craft. And I think, so I think that's really, really important. Oh, that's cool. Now, the other thing is uh, I listen to the Career Author Podcast. It's a weekly podcast. Episodes come out every Thursday, today being a Thursday. And I was just listening to the most recent one. Now, I, I usually listen to it while I'm, uh, well, I'm not I'm not going for runs as much anymore. But, uh, and, and it doesn't take me as long to wash the dishes, so I have to listen to it in small chunks. But one of the things I thought was fascinating is you've been a long time uh, gamer, like a video gamer. And one of the things that I thought was fascinating, and, and again, I haven't finished listening to it, so I'm going to prime you for some ideas, is, is the sentiment that, that playing, uh, particularly role-playing games, uh, can actually benefit you as a storyteller. They have me. Um, you know, I, I mentioned in the episode, I think that um, a lot, in a lot of ways, video games get a bad rap. Um, I think that there's a certain subset of games and gamers that... Um, and we talked about this in the podcast, like there's a lot of people who think of games and they think of, you know, oh, you just run around like online with people like shooting other people and stuff like that. And right. it's unfair to like blanket the entire gaming industry with that when in all actuality, in my opinion, the best storytelling in the world is being told in games right now. Um, I, I think that when you look at some of these, especially these big single player experiences, um, and you look at, you know, gamers out there know, like you look at a game like The Last of Us or you look at, um, uh, I, I love Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, you look at some like Death Stranding. Of course, I'm mentioning all these post-apocalyptic games. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but they all, they, they're amazing stories and, you know, they have, and they're like m movies in a lot of ways. I mean, they, they, uh, the writing's incredible. The cinematography is amazing. The music, you know, it's, it's on par with some movies you'd go see in the theater. And, uh, and, and, and you throw on top of that, the big thing, which is it's interactive. So you're actually along the right with, you're controlling a lot of the experience. And, you know, for me as a post-apoc writer, especially, and, you know, the best post-apoc is being done in video games. And to be able, you know, I said this in the podcast, when you like, let's say I watch him, I'm watching the walking dead, let's say, um, or, and I'm, I'm, I'm only getting to see what the camera wants me to see. But if I'm playing a game like, uh, horizon zero dawn, let's say, which is one of my favorite games ever. Um, and I like see this building, I can walk up to that building. I can look at it. I can go inside a lot of times. I can really get a feel for like what that environment looks like. And that has helped me immensely in world building and stuff in my books, because it's just, you can kind of go where you want to go for the most part. And you really get that interactive experience and really are along for the ride with the character in a way that you just can't replicate in books, movies, or comic books. So I was keeping my mic muted because the garbage truck is right outside the window. I didn't know if it was going to be picking up. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and, and that, that kind of leads me to the, um, question. And, and it kind of comes back to, to, to when we were working on this before, during and after, because you did mention it in the, in today's episode of your podcast was, was we spent a lot of time determining the rules of the universe. What was it that caused uh, all the, the world to end the electricity, uh, you know, going out a uh, solar flare, that kind of thing. How long would gasoline last? How long would right things last? Cause you talk about the realistic nature of, I think it was it in a particular video game where you could just go to a gas station and it doesn't matter how many yeah. years later it's still yeah, days gone is the name of the game. Yeah. So um, in terms of the interactivity uh, in a video game, you can actually um, explore in a, in a much more intimate way. Yeah. Is yeah. that it probably well beyond, I mean, I've long used um, Google maps. 
or Google Earth to re-explore a place and go, well, what would it look like standing on the street and turning left? <laughs> like, what, like, what would it, because it's been a while yeah. since I've been in the city or I've never stood there before. Um, is it, It's, it's got to be a little bit better than that, right, for some of the experiences? So I, I guess two years ago, um, uh, they put Sony for the PlayStation put out a exclusive Spider-Man game. And uh, I, it is literally a, it's New York. And when I say it's New York, I was watching a video where these guys who were very familiar with New York were playing that game and they were going to specific spots. (laughs) They were like, Oh, Hey, like uh, we're on this corner. We're on such and such corner. Uh, where's that sandwich shop that we like to go to? Oh, okay, well, like, so we need to go down the street, take a right, then take a left. And they literally were going to these places. Oh, so it was that realistic? It's that realistic. They wow. they visited the, um, what is it? The the uh, the firehouse from Ghostbusters, I think, is actually in New York. They, yes, visited, yeah. they visited that on the game. Oh, and wow. he, he, they even looked through the window and there was like a car with a sheet over it. So like <laughs> they knew when they were making the game, like the, that was the Ghostbusters house. And they made yeah. it look like that. So um, it some games are that realistic. Um, you know, I mentioned Horizon Zero Dawn. That takes place in what is you find out is basically Denver. Okay. And uh, it's, but it's like thousands of years in the future, but like the, the, the baseball stadium where the Colorado Rockies play and stuff is like still there and it's barely noticeable, but it's noticeable, you know? And so it's really interesting to see um, what you're saying. Like, I think obviously Google maps and stuff still serves a purpose because you're not going to find, if you're doing a game in Sheboygan or you're doing a, a movie or if you're writing a book that takes place in like Sheboygan, Wisconsin, right. I doubt you're going to be able to go to like a Spider-Man game and explore <laughs> Sheboygan. <laughs> you can't really leave Manhattan, can you? In most yeah, times. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to my buddy, Justin, who lives in Sheboygan. But, uh, but yeah, like, so obviously that serves a place, but you just, you still can get this really cool interactiveness that you just can't get in other mediums. Okay, cool. Well, uh, we're, we're going to take questions in a few minutes, but because this question I saw just pop up is related to video games, I thought I'd pop that up and show it. Uh, so Tori, who, you know, going for the morning run, very good. Could keep the mind stimulated as well as the body said. <laughs> uh, for someone who's never played a video game, what game might be a good place to start to gain a better understanding of story? Is there a high startup cost, special equipment, etc.? Um. Well, a lot of games you can, if you have a computer, a lot of games you can do on PC. Um, I'm a console gamer, so um, I play on PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch mostly, which is going to have a big startup cost. Right. Um, but uh, but there's a lot of stuff you can do on the computer. Um, there's a lot, if you're, if you're kind of a, if you're a um, very novice gamer, like I play a lot of um, these open world RPG games that do kind of take like some game knowledge, but... Um, there is a lot of stuff out there. Um, th- I don't, they're kind of a company still, but like telltale games, um, I, they shut down, they've like reopened. And so I don't know, but they tell very narrative driven games that are almost like old point and click adventures in a lot of ways. And they've done like walking dead games and Batman and back to the future and stuff. Um, but there are a lot of games out there that are more like, um, that are they're not i wouldn't call them visual novels but they are like a little simpler to get around and stuff like that so definitely look at any of the telltale stuff um there's also and these are playstation games but there's also stuff like uh detroit become human and until dawn i'm trying to think life is strange i think you can get that one on pc which are like really narrative driven games that are more like experiences than they are, you know, really immersive um, games that are going to take a lot of skill and stuff to play. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, We're going to skip over to a question about collaboration now. Okay. So uh, Lexi asks, uh, what would you say is the most important thing you have to do or to keep in mind to make a co-written or collaborative project successful? Great, great question, Lexi. Um, the first thing I would say is start small. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, it's really easy to get caught up and excited at first when you um, when you first meet somebody and you're thinking about collaborating. Uh, start with a short story or a couple of short stories. Don't go into it thinking like, "Oh, let's write this seven book series together and um, and and 
Cause the thing is, you just don't know, like once you actually get into it, like what your process is going to look like. So I think that's really important. Having a process is important. I think if you can find somebody, um, who has opposite skill sets as you, I think that's really good. So, um, again with Jay, he loves editing. I love first drafting. It's kind of a really good match. Um, so, and, and I can trust that he's going to come behind me and make really good revisions. Um, so I think those are important. And if you're, if you do end up getting into like a more longer term relationship, like Jay and I have, I think one thing that really gets overlooked is lifestyle. Um, you don't, Jay and I have very similar ambitions and goals and we have similar family situations and, um, you know, he's worked with collaborators who have totally different situations and like, he'll be working on a book and then he'll email them to ask them a question and get ghosted for two or three weeks. And that person will come back and say, Oh, sorry, I was on vacation and like, didn't even tell him. <laughs> so, um, I, I like stuff like that can be just kind of be on the same page, but I think the biggest thing is start small so that you can actually see if you got, if you're going to be able to work together. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, more questions about collaboration that are coming in. So I'm just going to keep rolling with them. Yeah. So uh, George asks, hi, Zach, or says hi, Zach, and then asks, do you have a working method to facilitate the works in a co-authorship? Because I know you and Jay are, are big on um, um, systems, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we do, we have a book um, out called um, planning your collaborative novel, I think is what it's called. Um, and that does kind of like demonstrate our process and gives you a lot of ideas about how you can co-author with somebody else. Um, and that's probably the best resource we have out there. Um, other than, you know, we've, we've talked about a lot in the career author, Mark, you've had us on, uh, stark reflections to talk about it before. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we do have that book available out there that, um, that really does document our processes. It, don't hold me to this. It might be free even. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> when you have that many books, it's hard to keep track of them all, right? <laughs> it might either be, it might even be free if you go to our website and join our list. I, I honestly can't, I can't that, remember. Careerauthor.com? Uh, yeah, it might the be at the careerauthor.com. Career yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, well, we can, we'll check on that later. That's all good. Um, there, here's another one about collaboration from uh, Alyssa from draft to digital who created all these great graphics that uh, we're using. <laughs> so Alyssa said, how did you learn to trust Jay to edit for you? I mean, how did you come to that level of trust uh, with, uh, with the co-collaborator like Jay? Um, it's, uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to give the answer that just for me personally, um, I've never been one to be really precious on words. It's, it's really easy for me to, I know a lot of people I talked about who talked about co-authoring or they get really worried about um, showing their work to somebody else and like wanting it to be absolutely perfect beforehand. I've never cared. I've always understood that we all write crappy first drafts. So like, it's just, I'm, it's not that precious to me. Right. So that a lot of that plays into how I was able to trust him. Now I wouldn't just trust anybody, but you know, after we'd gone through the first couple books together and I, I was able to see what he had done it became easier. You know, I, those first couple of books, I did read them way more than I ended up. And it became a thing where it was like, man, you're doing such a good job. I don't really need to look at this stuff as much anymore. And, uh, and so it just, it, I guess the really good answer is just time. And, and again, like we just have that relationship, you know, we are, um, we were friends a long time before we ever started writing a book and we talked about, and I understood like how much knowledge he has about story and that, and that he is totally capable of doing that. And, you know, it's, you can't have ego when you're doing this, there's two names on a cover. So you're going to have to give some stuff up and so are they. And um, maybe I give a little too much up by not wanting to necessarily go back and read everything and be okay with that. But, um, but yeah, it just takes some time sometimes. <laughs> and and it also displays that you're you're looking forward, you're not looking back, right? Because you're actually making progress. Which is a big thing with me. I I, I want to keep moving forward and I just want to be done. So Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll let you take a sip while I we're gonna migrate over. There's some questions that are coming in that are sort of generic marketing questions, but I think they're valuable because you okay. know you've got a lot of experience and can probably help them out with this. Hopefully. So uh Jamie asks, uh, when should you start marketing yourself trying to get a following? Should you wait till you have at least 15 or more books, or should you start now with only one or two books? I think you start as soon as you can. Um uh like 
I mean, you definitely want to at least have a mailing list and be building that in any way you can. Um, you know, have the understanding that it's obviously going to be harder to get yourself out there if you're in that one to three book range, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't start building your platform. Um, and you have to understand, like, if you have one book out there, I, I wouldn't necessarily be like spending a lot of time mark, like marketing that one book. I would be trying to build my list and, you know, like have a short story that you're enticing people to come to, um, you know, and, and stuff like that. But I wouldn't spend a lot of time like just marketing that one book. Cause there's a lot of people who are going to come to your page and if they see it's a book in a series and there's no other books out yet, it's going to be really hard for them to trust a new author. So, um, it's a balance. Like I think the biggest thing is just building your audience and building your list. Um, but like using that for your marketing time and, uh, keep writing books. Like that's to market your books and sell more books. Writing more books is still going to be your best thing. And obviously, you know, running ads and stuff is important, but I, I wouldn't be running a bunch of ads on my books until I have more books behind them in the series to, you know, help you get a return on investment and hook. Cause a lot of people like I have, if I get a book bub, let's say on my seven book empty body series, which I actually have one Tuesday coming up. Oh, awesome. um, Congrats. Thank you. Uh, it's the first book in series is free, but you'll be surprised how many people will see your ad and they'll just buy the whole series that first day. And if you get a book bub and you only have one or two books in that series, you're missing all that. And there's only so many times you can go into that well before you start seeing diminishing returns. Right. So when you start using those types of services, you know, I would really be make sure I had my ducks in a row and had plenty of books out in the series because again, you're, you can only put that book in front of those readers so many times, even though they grow their list, you're still going to get dimension returns the more you do that. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is kind of related to that. It's almost within and you sort of uh, talked about it a bit, but uh, Diaz says, uh, what is the best way to get an email list? Is social media the best way to go with that? Um, Mark, Mark knows why I'm laughing. <laughs> um, I, cause I'm very anti-social media. Um, and it's actually weird for me to be on Facebook right now. <laughs> I know my face is there, but I'm not there. Um, for me, like I can social media have a place to build a list. Yeah, it can. I think it's a good place to chat with readers if that's your thing. Um, but I built the majority of my list through my books and through, um, you know, calls to action at the back of my books, doing free promos, uh, doing stuff with doing mailing list swaps with other authors, you know, doing cross promotion that way. Um, and, and I'll be honest, it's daunting and it can really seem easy to want to go straight to social media, but it's to me, that's kind of a, and, there, and look, there's authors who've done that. There's plenty of authors who've built audiences on social media. I'm just not one of them. And I just don't think, I think it's a good place to go and interact with, like existing readers, even though I'm not really a fan of that either. I think it potentially can be, but as far as like building uh, an audience, I don't know. That's a tough, that's tough for me to say okay. that necessarily. And so I know uh, because uh, I listen to uh, you guys every week that uh, digital min minimalism, Cal Newport, and uh, that that has actually helped you become more productive and write more. Is that, is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I would say so because I I, sp I don't have those anxieties of like, I need to go check social media. I need to go spend time on there. I need to go, um, you know, d d do whatever on there like that. Cause, and cause like my, and it can, that sounds really counterproductive as an author because I think we make the assumption of like, oh, we need to be on social media. Like that's how, where else are we going to talk to people? We <laughs> like how we, you know, but like, I would question that process. Like I would question like, do you, cause I, I just communicate my, with my readers through my list. Now, okay. again, how do you get that list? <laughs> it's not going to happen overnight. We, we all start from zero. Okay. And, and, but the thing is that my list I've built, you know, I have thousands of people on a mailing list, but it's been built through books and promo swaps. And it's very targeted towards people in my genre who like reading my stuff. So I know when I send a new, like, when Dead South comes out, which is the zombie book I'm working on, I know that I have all these readers on there who like that stuff and they're, and right. most of them are probably going to buy it. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a tricky thing when you're starting from zero though. And, um, you know, but I, I just personally never had a ton of luck on social media. Well, I think it's a, a pretty fair, uh, I, I mean, we make assumptions that people know these, but I think it's worth mentioning is when somebody finishes 
Empty Bodies, the first book in the series, right? That's going to be in the book bub uh, next week. That's you're going with book one, right? Yep. Is the when they finish that, there's obviously a, a information that book two exists or the whole series, and there's probably a hey, do you want access to this story or this extra content? Maybe it's book two, whatever your offer is. Um, when they finish the book, chances are if they're interested in you and what you write, they will sign up. Yep. And that's way more powerful than you know tweeting something to a broad audience that isn't even targeted. And 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 she was like, well, but I have you know 5,000 followers on Twitter. How come nobody looked at it? Well, because they weren't the people who just finished the book. Yeah, right? and you're just another, you're just more noise in their feed, you know? Right. And I think that's the big thing. Um, Cause yeah, you're right. Like when people get to the, when a reader gets to the end of empty bodies, I offer them the second book for free. So um, it gives them a link. It'll take them to, I have book funnel, which every author should have. Um, and, uh, and uh, sorry, I was a train of thought. Well, we had a chat with Damon last week about book funnel. Yeah. So look for it in our feed. Awesome. <laughs> but, yeah. So check that out. Um, and, uh, but it t I have the book funnel integration with my mailing list. So okay. they, download the book, they give their email address, it puts them on my list and they get the second book for free. And at that point, to me, that getting that reader on my list is worth it for me. And to and instead of that extra sale, and now they're on my list and they get a free book and hopefully they're going to go buy the other five books in the series, you know, okay. that in which a lot of them do. So um, to me, that's more powerful. And that first book is perma-free. So it gets pretty steady traffic. Um, and then w obviously when I run like, ENTs and book bubs and stuff. I get a, a nice little surge there too, but that's how I've built a lot of my list. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to, I'm going to play devil's advocate and, 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 and uh, talk about a seeming contradiction. Okay. You've gone and you've removed all these apps off your phone. You've limited contact, right? I think your wife can get a hold of you when you're on a walk. So you're not being distracted. You're not listening to stuff. You're actually, you know, uh, on your walk, enjoying the environment for your creative process. Um, and yet you talk about playing video games is how do you reconcile the fact that you, you're not playing Candy Crush or any of those little <laughs> distracting games on your phone and yet you do enjoy video games. Now, how, how does that fit into your world as a writer? Yeah. And that's a great question. Um, and, and it's something that Cal Newport talks in, about in the book and he addresses video games directly. Um, the thing for me, I think is that it's, I think I would have to stop it if it was an addiction. Okay. Um, if it was, if it was something that I, if I was, if I was like doing 30 minutes of work in the morning and then going, Oh, I'm done with this. I'm going to go sit down and play video. And I play video games for two hours. Then it would be a problem. Um, I have just, to me, getting the stuff off my phone is more about like not being on social media and all that stuff just makes me happier because if you look out there, there's a lot of studies that say, that our social media use and just our, our digital use of always having this thing in our pocket that constantly buzzes at us and is trying to get our attention is really what's doing a lot of the, the anxiety and depression that's going on with people. And so that not having those things just makes me happier and makes me be able to concentrate more video games for me is more of like, okay, I've worked today. I've done my thing this is going to be like my wind down thing I do at night for like an hour, hour and a half when my daughter goes to bed, you know? Um, and my wife will hang out. She'll watch me play games or she'll play stuff with me and we'll, we'll hang out and stuff. So um, it, it, I guess what it really comes down to is I'm able to just to control it. And uh, it's, it's, it's more, um, I look at it as the same thing as like people who like to watch Netflix at night. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I, I think as a storyteller, watching television and movies is great. You're learning. But the difference is if you're doing that instead of working, that's where I think things can get a little tricky. Um, but games make me happy. Facebook doesn't. I guess that's really, I guess that's really <laughs> what, what it really comes down to for me. And if I, and I do want to consciously limit my screen time. Like I, I definitely want that. That's important to me. So I will take screen time away from my phone and other places and put that into video games. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I love that. Uh, that is amazing. So we've got about uh, a minute or so left. Uh, I didn't know if there was uh, one of my favorite segments from your podcast is uh, Jay's oh, Ways and Sacks Hacks. You knew I was going to throw this at you, didn't you? Is there a quick hack you can share with uh, with folks, a writer hack? 
if you oh you said rider hack i was about to promote my beer again that i'll like. oh <laughs> <laughs> you can promote the beer i'm i'm happy with promoting craft beer if you like stout beer you should definitely try samuel smith organic chocolate stout Another one that's really good is Left Hand Milk Stout. That's my other favorite. Oh, Left Hand Milk Stout is amazing. That's the one with the hand logo, right? That was yeah. the, yeah. That's um, actually what I tried to get last night. But you could know. say it makes your prose smoother when you are when you have have just there one you while you're working on it, right? There you go. <laughs> well, Zach, thank you so much for spending the time uh, to hang out with me today and sharing some wisdom on collaboration as well as video games and all of the amazing stuff you do. Great. Uh, best of luck on your uh, book club next week. And looks like I lost uh, Zach, uh, accidentally dropped out of the studio. So thank you guys. Thank you, Zach, for hanging out today. And thank you guys. Zach has come back. He's going to say, just so he can say goodbye. Oops, I accidentally hit the wrong button, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, thank you, Mark, for having me. And thank you, everyone who showed up and asked questions and everything. I definitely appreciate it. All right, thanks. You take care and you guys take care out there as well.